Okay, guys, thanks very much for being here with uh, James Benson and braving the snowstorm. James has a ton of experience on building teams. He's made a ton of mistakes, and he's going to share them with you. And all of them. All of them, all of them, which is perfect. So um, I will leave the floor to you. James. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. All right, so one thing I always want to do whenever I'm coming in to talk with people or, or talk at brokerages is make sure that everyone leaves here happy. So before we get started, is there anything that you guys want to make sure gets covered today? Are there any burning questions that you want answered? You walk out of here. So many. I don't know. Okay, they're going to come up. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to share some stuff for me that worked, some of my philosophies. Um, just based on my experience, a lot of Gary Keller stuff, I, I tend not to reinvent the wheel a lot, and then use a lot of what he says. Okay. And from there, I, I sometimes make some tweaks. Um, but yeah, no, I'm happy to share all of my all of my failures as well. So the, you know, it's it's funny. I think a lot of people come in and they stand in front of them and they train, and, and you look at them and you go, "How do they have it all figured out?" I find it so hard. Um, and maybe those people really do have it figured out, and. and but no one shares with you typically their failures. You know, when they when they share their business with you, their life with you, they share their Instagram moments, right? It's the highlight reel. Yeah. No one ever shows themselves crashing into a tree on Instagram. Like it's, <laughs> it's, so, but I'll I'll share with you guys my tree crashes, and if, if you want to know anything more, I'm happy to share that all. Yeah. I think you know that experience, the painful lessons are typically the ones where, where you learn the most. You know, mm -hmm. when you get they, they say when you hit rock bottom, but even if you just hit the ground and you hit hard, those are the best lessons. I find life tends to give you little nudges and say, hey. Do this, do this, and if they're so gentle, we ignore them. It's only the catastrophic thuds that make us go, okay, I probably shouldn't do that anymore. So, anyway. Okay, so, um, again, what will make the, today's success for you? Just If you have any questions that come up, I want to make sure they get answered. Um, because we've got you guys in there, we could probably freestyle a little bit too. So, any other questions that you want to get covered or any other things you want to pick up my brain, I'm happy to do that. Um, we're going to talk about deciding what work to keep. Um, what your daily business priorities are, what jobs you want to get rid of, which is, I guess, the flip side of deciding what to keep. We're going to talk about the type of leverage, or different types of leverage, um, and then, I guess, when to hire, because it seems to be a really big question that a lot of people have. So, just so I understand what we're dealing with here, um, you guys, and your real estate is, where are you at in your businesses right now? Like, are you, do you know the different levels, the MRE levels, one through seven? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to cover that too, which is good. Um, but basically one is solo agent, two is agent plus assistant, three is agent plus a couple more assistants. Where are you guys right now in the, in the spectrum of, like, do you have a team? What does it look like if you do? I'm at a two. You're a two? Okay. So yeah, I work with my daughter, and then we just got my <coughs> other daughter in as a um, operation manager. Okay, so your other daughter's an admin, and then yeah, you've got exactly. you, your daughter number one that was there first. She's yes. a showing assistant, a buyer's agent, and she's, she work for you? She's partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are business partners. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. And we're uh, we're four-ish, hovering between four and five. I'm ready to Probably know closer to four. Yeah. Me too. But you are. <laughs> it's, it's funny. So the one thing I'll say right off the bat is a lot of people think the goal is to get to level seven, and it is for some people. For some people. The goal is to get to level one. I think we have a tendency to chase and think, oh, I've only achieved success or I've only done it if I made it to this level or that level. And truly, one of the biggest questions you have to answer for yourself is, what do you want to be? Because to get to level seven, you know, there's a lot of hitting the ground. And some people have the energy for it, and some people don't. Some people say, hey, I'm really, really good. I love working with buyers. And if that makes you happy every single day and you just want to be a solo agent and you want to hire and have an assistant, maybe two assistants, great. Do that. If you want to go up to level seven, do that. But, but again, when we're talking about different levels here, there are no goals other than, there's no external goals, just the goals you want to achieve. Okay, So don't ever feel compelled, I have to get to level seven, I have to get to level six. It's what makes you feel happy at the moment. If you're happy doing that, and you have nothing else to do outside of real estate, stick with this as your, as your day job. Hire assistants, hire team members, make yourself leverage. But if you're saying, you know, I want to open this other business, I want to open a pharmaceutical company over here, and the only way I can do that, is if I build this to a level six or level seven so that I can exit that business, then go over here and work on that, then that's that's why you get to level seven. You go to level seven when you want complete leverage and you want other businesses to open. You can open other businesses because you've proven in this business that you can create a business that's autonomous that runs by itself essentially. Okay? Alright. So, Gary Keller. Uh, you will eventually have no choice but to either make less money or to jump into becoming leveraged. So 
you're starting this now, and I guess everyone in this room is leveraged. We've all started hiring assistants and things like that, hiring different team members. So we made that choice to grow and to, to make more money, which is great. Sorry, I'm going to go back. So just a quick recap, these are the seven levels that we just talked about in the beginning. The left side is sales and marketing, the right side is administration and processing. So in the beginning it's you and you, you're of course the admin as well as the salesperson. And as we leverage up, we get our first assistant, we go to level three, we get our next two assistants, and when we go to the next level, we have assistants and we have, we start to hire team members. We lead buyer agent, can be showing assistants, some people like to run the showing assistant model. Um, so people like to run the buyer agent model. I run a hybrid of both right now, personally. The people that are on, I've got two buyer's agents or two showing assistants, and what their role is, is purely determined, um, I want to say on a case-by-case -case basis. For me, it depends. If I'm handling the negotiation of the transaction, they just covered the showings for me, they're showing assistants on that transaction. If they are going to handle all the negotiation from it, they're buyer's agents. So if I don't have to touch it, they're a buyer's agent. But my showing assistants will handle all purchaser visits, will handle all the showings ahead of time. And if I've got a client, let's say if the great, I've got a client that's, that this morning wanted to see a, a $2 million home and I couldn't make it because I had another appointment. She went out, handled that, and they instantly said, I want to put in an offer. They don't get 25% of that transaction. They have to put in a certain amount of work with each client before they qualify for, for the 25% of the commission that a, that a showing assistant does. If they act as a buyer's agent on it, for me, they're up to about 40%, sometimes 50%, depending on certain circumstances. Um, if they just do a one-off showing and the person buys, I'll throw them 500 bucks, which is more than adequate for an hour's worth of work. Mm -hmm. When they hit 10 showings, <coughs> things tend to flip over and turn into a showing assistant. Other than that, what are you paying them on showing, as being a showing assistant? Um, you pay them a salary? No, 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 no. I pay them off of trades always, but it's generally like I think 100 bucks or 200 bucks. Oh, okay. I think it's 100 bucks actually, but once they cross 10 showings with a the client, they're right up into the 25% of okay. the commission category. And, and some people, you know, they'll say, well, when you just get them to nine showings and then stop and do all the rest yourself, the answer is no. I don't, I don't want to do that to my people because I have to give in order for them to give back. It's just kind of that, that reciprocation. Are they prospecting at the same time? Absolutely. You're working with me, you are on the phones, or you're drawn like and you're doing something. And then the, what happens to those clients? Those are their clients. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay. And, and so so basically, I have a bunch of leads that come in from the meetings. I do a lot of advertising online for pre-construction and whatnot. So my database is ten to 12,000. So I've got a section in my database that we call the pond. And so my agents, I'll go fishing in the pond. For these oh, okay. So I've got, so they can literally go in. And the pond is set to refresh every three months. So if you're in there and you're calling and you're calling and you're calling, mm -hmm. if you call Joe Smith today mm -hmm. and they're not interested, great. They're going to fall off their call list yeah. for three to four months. Yeah. Three to four months, they're going to pop back on. Now you can call them and they might say, call me back in a month. Yeah. And you just set a little reminder to call back in a month and that's great. But what I do... But does it go back in the pond after that? Yeah, like, like okay. it, it could, it could. Yeah, it, so then I could call that guy, same guy, well, a month could, later, and, and I, I hit because... Right, so let me tell you how it works, because this will yeah. eliminate the concern. Yeah. We have the pond, we've got this big, we've got this big group of fish, and I draw fish, but a horrible at drawing. Okay. Horrible at drawing. New pen coming. New pen coming. I got one here. So when we're in the pond, people go fishing in here. Right. We'll make the pond round like a pond. Okay. <laughs> and That's a good pond. you'll be dialing in the pond, you'll be dialing yeah. in the pond. And my goal is for you to pull 50 of the hottest, ready to buy now people that you can out of this pond. Mm -hmm. So you might, on in the first week, in week one, you might call 50 people, and you'll move all 50 people out of the pond and into your contact list. So you got 50 people here. And you'll pull out 50, and Irene will pull out 50. <laughs> so we've got 50 of the hottest people we could find prospecting. Now week two, you might be calling again, and you might find five people that are really hot. So you take your bottom five out of this 50, you throw them back in the pond, and you bring five, five of your hottest one out. My goal is that every single time you're dialing and you find someone really hot, mm -hmm. you throw back a small fish, you take out a big fish. Oh. I want, so over time, you're not able to do it in week one, yeah. but once you've been on the phone 
week yeah. after week after week, you just keep top grading. So when you're doing your lead follow-up, you're doing your lead follow-up, eventually it just keeps getting hotter and hotter with people that want to buy now, now, now. <laughs> so let's say over a three month period, you built a really, really hot group of 50 clients that should keep you busy as anything, okay? And, and again, if someone falls off, oh, we decided not to sell, back in the pond. Fish, bring another one out. I'm so, so what do you call hot? Did you get an appointment? Yeah. yeah if, if they have to be motivated. A, they've got to be looking for a home. B, yeah. they've got to be willing to meet. Yeah, it's not willing yeah. to meet. Appointment. Yeah. Yeah. It's not hot. Yeah. It's okay. And then if you know their motivation, yeah. oh, we're moving for this reason or for that reason. Yeah. Great. You now know that they're motivated. Mm -hmm. They're willing to meet you. And they want to move, let's say, within six months. That's, that's what I would put into that pond. Mm -hmm. okay. But again, if you've got everyone that wants to move in 45 days and you've got a new person in the pond that wants to move in 15 days, yeah. you're taking a 45er yeah. and you're throwing it back and bringing it to 15. You're capped at 50 because there's only so many leads that you can call back and service in a given week on your lead follow-ups to have those meaningful conversations with them, right? Mm -hmm. Getting in touch with mortgage brokers, getting the staging ready, let's say you're talking those conversations about how we can add value to your home before it goes to market, et cetera. So um, that's, that's how I do it. So to answer your question of, well, what if someone else calls them, they're only going to call them if you throw them back in yeah, the pond. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you call yeah. someone a year and they say, yeah, try me back in a year. Yeah. yeah. You might make a note, try them back in a year. You make the notes from the call, save it. And next time in a year, I really may get that call. You may get that call. Mm -hmm. In the pond, it's anyone's game. But you take out whatever you want. Oh, so when you throw back in the pond, you throw the, the, the notes as well? Yeah, yeah, because okay. okay. the notes are all made in one central database. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, yeah, and they have to be that way, right? Yeah, just yeah. The, no, yeah. But otherwise, you, otherwise, you put that in the pocket for a year or whatever. Yeah, you got it. So everyone lead generates out of the pond. Okay. Okay, and you know, if they go door knocking too, that's fine if they want to do that. Sometimes yeah. people say, I want to go door knocking, I don't want to be on the phones. Mm -hmm. How about it? I, I really don't care how you lead generate, yeah. I care that you lead generate. Yeah. And as long as you get the minimum standards of 100 voice to voice contacts every week, mm -hmm. I'm set. Okay. That makes me happy. Yeah. And it should make them happy. Because yeah. their business are going to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And so then it becomes my job to sit there with these people. And it's a funny thing because you go from being an agent and just going out and lead genning, lead genning, lead genning, and doing things your way yeah. to now I've got a team. Manage these guys. Well, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and so you, your role shifts entirely. Yeah. It stops from being an agent that's lead genning your way. You still have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But now I've got to sit down, I've got to meet with you once a week. Hey, what's going on? Yeah. Where are you winning? Where are you losing? Where do you need my help? Mm -hmm. Great. Where are you winning? Where are you losing? Where do you need my help? You're coaching these people. And so when it comes time to lead gen, doing it all together in the same room or being highly visible as a team leader doing the lead gen is really the only way to make sure that they're going to be doing it too. Because if you're saying, you guys lead gen, I don't have to, I'm the I'm, you know, boss man, it doesn't go over very well. Yeah. There's a complete not a lack of respect, but it, it, it's, it ends up being... They follow what you do, not what you yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Speed of leader, speed of why the pack. Do I mean, why do I have to do it if you don't do it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're going to do what you do, whether they like it or not. So you've got to get down and do it. You have to lead by example. So, so my, my question is always, like, why, why don't these guys just go on their own? Why are, they, why are they working with you on a team? That's a good question. So that's your value proposition. Yeah, that in, 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 I already nailed it 100% there. It does come back to value proposition. I have to be able as a team leader to make you make more money because you're with me than mm -hmm. you would make on your yeah, own. Okay. And, and that's the only way okay. it makes sense. Okay. Unless people are really social animals and just really want to be around the group of people. Yeah. So, which is a piece of it. Culture is a huge piece of any business. I mean, KW's culture is what is what allows us to thrive and buy everyone yeah. so quickly. I mean, the amount of growth that this company has seen mm -hmm. over the past decade has been phenomenal. It's yeah. a huge driver that's been culture. We've had tech, we've got education, we've got a whole bunch of great things. The culture's been a big piece. So. Culture needs to be there on every team. Yeah. The culture on my team is different than the culture on your team, different than the culture on your team. And so you've got to surround yourself with people that fit in your particular mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. right. um, but again, this will people will only join you if you make their lives better. So it can be business, it can be personal, it can be holding them accountable to their personal goals. People generally don't like accountability. Like mm -hmm. It's generally yeah. uncomfortable, yeah. right? Yeah. For all of us. I don't know of anyone that, yeah. that truly loves it. People say they do. And I think you can in a lot of ways and a lot of times. Well, because you see the results of, of, of being accountable. Right, but it, it's not comfortable. Yeah. Like any time you grow, yeah, you're whether it's you're physically in the gym, you have to break yourself down. You literally have to tear the muscles and then they get built up stronger. Um, in business, you have to break yourself a little bit or tear yourself a little bit <laughs> and you get built up stronger. And that's, that's generally the practice. There is a discomfort that goes along with that that you can learn to like. Because 
I mean, if you spend two hours every day this week lead generating, I guarantee you, you could have a good time lead generating. Mm -hmm. But I bet we could find more fun things to do in the two hours. Oh, of course. Right. Yeah. However, when you start cashing the paychecks, yeah, yeah, and then you can do whatever the heck you want for a week. Yeah. Vacation somewhere beautiful. Yeah. That's even better than what you would have done. Yeah. It's, it's a delayed gratification yeah. conversation, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I completely. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, everyone is sleeping. One through here. Okay. So. On the next. So a big. A big part of when your job starts to shift is, is deciding what work you're going to keep and what work you're not going to keep. So there's, there's two ways to look at this. And it really comes down to you, your lifestyle, and what your goals are. If your goal is to run the most profitable business that you can, then what you keep is all the high dollar producing work or the high the high dollar value work. And what you give away is everything that's that's lower than what your, your hourly rate is. And does everyone know how to calculate their hourly rate? Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get, we'll get figure out how many hours you work first. Well, yeah. It's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? I, yes, you're absolutely right. What I tend to do is I boil everything down to, to 37.5 or 40 hours a week, and I know we don't work 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's impossible for us to know kind of what we do and what we don't do. But if we just use 40 hours a week as our standard currency of measurement, we can apply 40 hours a week to our admin because it's reasonable that they're going to work you know, 37.5 or 40 hours a week, whatever the magic is. Um, and if we're using that same equation, we can calculate what our time is worth versus what their time is worth. Because what does an admin cost? And I guess anywhere from 35 up to sky's the I mean, you can spend 100 plus on an admin, 200 plus if you go to like a C-suite executive. The admin is down in the, the, let's say, Royal Bank, and the big buildings downtown, they're making 200 plus. Yeah. They're really good admins. But they better be quick. <laughs> they, they better be very good. Now their bosses are making fourteen million plus, so yeah, yeah. The, the balance is, yeah. is there. I'll pay two hundred to anyone who can make me fourteen million. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd hire a lot of them. Um, so, deciding what work to keep as we leverage ourselves. This is the first part of leverage: is you're giving stuff away, right? You're giving away tasks to somebody else that's not you, and this is the hardest part, mentally, because if you're like me what you have is you have your set way of doing things. And the one thing I learned, and I heard it for years, and it took me a while to actually sink in, and when I hired the right person, I began to see it. You think you're really good at things, and then you give it away to someone who is actually really good at things, and you realize how bad you were at, at certain <laughs> things. Um, so for example, working open houses. I'm not really great at open houses. It, it's not really strong. But I figured, you know, I can go in, I can be social with people, that's great. There's some people that, that just naturally, have you ever met someone and they just emanate warmth? Like you look at their eyes and it's like, they could just walk up to you and give you a hug and it would be fine. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that if they walk up to you and give you a hug, it'd be creepy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. like <coughs> we know those types of people. I know if I walk up to people and start giving them a hug, I'm going to be scaring them and, and freaking them out. But that works for some people. It's just not, it just doesn't work for me. I hope I'm not creepy. Uh, <laughs> There's many more creepy people than you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Those, those are creepier. So okay. of course, if I didn't know you and you came up to give me a hug, that action would be creepy. I get punched, yeah. 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 Some people I know can get away with that, I can't. Anyway. Um, so what you need to do is first understand what you are doing. And this is where a lot of people fall down. Um, Darren Hardy, the famous real estate coach, what he did, I guess, for a number of weeks, he wore a stopwatch around his neck. And every time he was in an activity that produced revenue, he pressed go on the stopwatch. Oh, that's great. And, and when he wasn't, he pressed stop on the stopwatch. And what he was finding when he got through the, most of his days, he was getting about 20 to 25 minutes of dollar productive work, and the rest was just noise taking him out. And so it's kind of staggering when you look at how productive you think you are versus how productive you actually are. So if you really want to take this experiment to the extreme, you get a stopwatch and hang it around your neck and, and, and go for it. And the reason you hang it around your neck is because you can't oh, forget about it if yes, it's sitting right here. There. If you just say, oh, I'm going to punch in at this time, yeah. you'll get distracted, you'll get a copy, and you'll forget. But yeah. for some reason, there's a stopwatch around your neck, you remember. But you need to keep a list of every single thing that you do. And if you just do this exercise for a week, it's great. You can gain the system for maybe one or two days where you say, I'm going to beat the system. I'm going to lead generate every day for two hours here. And you get your first day in, your second day in, but then our normal habits tend to take hold, and you'll start to see what you're actually doing. Okay. Now you have to answer the question, what's not happening that should be? The answer for most people automatically is lead gen followed by lead follow-up. Those are two things that a lot of people miss straight away. But there are three other activities, and we're going to cover those as we go along, that we need to be, we need to be doing. And then we need to determine our hourly rate. 
And that simply is our GCI, our gross commission income from, let's say, last year. And then I divide that by 50. 50 because I assume we're all entitled to a two weeks vacation. Maybe more, but I think, you know, I think we need a break at some point through the year. And if we don't, I think we're actually going to end up running our businesses slower and, and not as effectively if we don't take the time for a little bit of mental refresh. When you do that, James, you don't factor in uh, conferences and stuff like that? You so should. When, when, when I figure out my work weeks, I always put in the, the time that I know I'll be away. I do it for lead gen. I still consider that work. So for me, if I'm, let's say, going to be, well, we just had family reunion. And so let's say in the month of February, I was going to be down one week. I still consider myself working. But what that's, what that's going to happen, what that is going to affect is when I'm able to lead generate. Because when you're at the conferences, it, you know, you're falling in during your lead generation time. So I know that by the end of February, I have to hit certain numbers. If I'm out for a week, I need to do 33% more lead gen on each of the three weeks that I am working that month. You know, I never want to go into what I call lead gen debt. And lead gen debt is when you're falling behind on your contacts. You know, you can go into a surplus. If I'm going into family reunion and I've hit, let's say I've hit 400 you know, real estate conversations and I'm walking into the third week of February going to family reunion, I could in theory take the rest of, of February off and I, that month, hit my lead gen numbers. I've been 100% accountable, I'm good. So with planning, I like to get the only gen surplus and let my surplus dwindle down to even rather than getting into lead gen debt. And I think what a lot of people tend to do, just to decide when they get into lead gen debt, they say, oh no, I didn't make any contacts last week. I have to make 200 this week to get back to normal. And you do have to make up last week's contacts. But sometimes, if we, what's your favorite restaurant? Is there a good restaurant around here? I like Reese across the street. Across the street? Reese. Yeah. Reese. Something a little further? Asian Fusion. Oh, uh, you said around here. Uh, yeah, like a block or two. <coughs> That's where we all go. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's right here. And okay, it's so, so if I ask you to, to walk to the restaurant, you're going to get there, right? Yeah. Okay. okay. If I say I need you to sprint at your all out max down two blocks, you're going to tire. And when you get there, you're not having fun anymore. You feel awful. Like <laughs> yeah. you just emptied yourself. I find when people try and sprint and try to make up the 200 contacts in one week, they get to that awful place. Yeah. I think you're better off to say, okay, I fell behind last week. I have 100 contacts to make up for. I'm going to do it across the next five weeks. I'm going to add 20 contacts per week for the next five weeks. And there's certain days where you might be in that lead gen flow and I'm just going to keep going. I hit 20 today, I'm going to go for 25, I'm going to go for 30, I'm going to go for 40, whatever feels good that day. Your minimum becomes 20 because you're not going to slip further behind. But you can start reeling in those contacts over time. And if you treat it more like an endurance race rather than a sprint, because if you're trying to sprint an endurance race, you're dead. You're, you're never going to make it. You're going to fall off. Um, you can recover that over time. But I think that's, that's one of the things that, that, that people do is, is they really stay, they beat themselves up first. So the first thing you do is you, you've taken energy out of yourself by, your, by beating yourself up, saying, I didn't do it. Oh, I'm, not, I'm failing on this. The mental anguish and the stress that goes with that isn't good. And on top of that, you start adding the pressure of trying to, to sprint all the way down the street. And then you don't do anything. Because right. You're then you get complete paralysis. Shut, you get complete shutdown. Yeah. It's, it's no different. Yeah. I, I like to use analogies like for the gym because like everyone at some point in their life has had a workout that's made them sore. And if you go to the gym today and you just go nuts for six hours, you think you're making headway. But tomorrow when you can't even move and get out of bed, I guarantee you're not going to the gym. And the next day when you can't still move and get out of bed, like you'll break yourself for a week. And so I might have got 40 contacts today, but by the end of next week, I found myself in other 60, 80 contacts in, in debt. And so it just gets worse. So you just kind of have to start piecing it over time, which is why I like to be in surplus before I go in. Anyway, a little bit of a sidebar. Um, so so yeah. what, can I, I'm, I'm going to ask you something on that, and, yeah. and hopefully you won't uh, usurp our time. So um, I'm much more focused on my, my past clients right now. Well, like just so I can get to all of them because there's there's so many of them. And what I find is because it's people that know me, like me, and trust me, and we have these long conversations. Like sometimes I can I can make ten phone calls in an hour and have like four or five contacts. Like they're all meaningful contacts. Yeah. But then you know you can't get the quality unless you have the quantity. And I find uh, now that I'm doing this, I'm like stay on the phone. Taking up time, which is a lot longer than are you moving, are you moving, are you moving, are you moving. Yeah. 
So how do you, how do you get that balance? How do you get the, the, you maintain the quality so you don't sound like you're just calling? Yeah, you, you don't want your clients to feel like a commodity. Right. Right. But sometimes it's, yeah, it, it almost is that way when you're just trying to churn through the numbers. That, that to me is a, it's almost part of the bigger conversation. But I, I totally get it. So we're always taught to say, oh, you know, this is a business conversation. I take up two minutes of your time. And that's well and dandy. But inside, I think that makes a lot of us uncomfortable, myself included. So there's, there's easier ways to go about that, and there's harder ways to go about it. So a typical lead gen day for me, it, does anyone ever have sometimes a hard time making the first few calls? Like it just, once you get the momentum going, I find you're good. So I generally like to pop on Facebook really quickly, not to check out posts or anything like that. But you go to the notifications, it'll list whose birthday it is today. And so if there's five birthdays sitting right there, those are people that are A, going to pick up your phone call. B, they're going to be really, really happy to hear from you. And then and C, those are the people that you can probably just slip in a quick conversation about real estate. And if you don't feel comfortable doing it that day because you haven't talked with them in a while, give them a call, wish them a happy birthday, get all the stuff out of the way. Put them on your call list for tomorrow. Because when you called them yesterday and you called them back again tomorrow, they're probably yeah, going to pick up again. I forgot to ask you. Exactly. That's exactly what I did. It's like, yeah, hey, exactly. yesterday I forgot to ask you, and my coach had all me, so I really apologize for giving you a call back. But do you have two minutes for me? Great. Because you've already yeah. given, you've already given, you've already given them congratulations. You've already given them that warm, fuzzy feeling. Now it's okay to ask. Like if I just come up to you and I say, you know, hey, can I have a hundred bucks? You're going to have a hundred bucks. But if I said to you, hey, here's a bar of gold, can I have a hundred bucks? You'd be like, yeah, I'll give you a hundred bucks. Like it, you've given value. Reciprocity. Now we don't have to give, we don't have to give gold, yeah, reciprocity. We don't have to give gold. We can give warm, fuzzy feelings. We can give advice. We can give opportunity. We can give all kinds of things that don't cost us anything. But as soon as we've given, it's really easy to ask for something back. And as soon as you give, you, you can be calling past clients and it can be, hey, you know, I just wanted you to know that the house down the street from me sold. And I know you bought it 800,000 two years ago. In the home, really, it's not in as in good condition as yours. Just sold for 1.2 million. So I want you to know, you made 400,000 beautiful tax-free dollars. Congratulations! You can see that information. I like that. Yeah, and it's it, it's a really nice call. It cost you nothing, but you gave them value, right? And so now you can have this, now you can have another conversation. It's like, hey, I really help my I really love helping my clients do what you've done and making great money. You know, we help people with investment properties all the time. We help people with buying and selling homes. Do you know anyone that I can be talking to that, you know, that I could help? Because it's it's a part of the business that I really love is making people smile and making money. <clears throat> you just asked for a referral, but you asked if you could help more people essentially. So it's it's kind of set up or framed up in a way that's a win-win. And it just becomes I find it really easy to ask for ask for business that way if you will. I know we've been doing that. Who do you know that we should have a conversation with? Yeah, you know, it's funny, I had a conversation two nights ago with someone I called, and he said, I went back into the sales center to pick all my finishes, and, and he said, do you know what my unit is selling for now? And I went, uh-oh, I, I didn't know. Uh -oh. And I said, well, no, no, what are they selling for now? And he said, 850. I'm like, wow, yeah, what did we buy it for again? 620. I'm like, that's been, a, that's been about a year now. He said, you've made, you know, over $200,000 in just under a year. Congratulations. You know, that worked out obviously really well. We know the market hasn't gone down, so I knew it was going to yeah. be up. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to be up over two hundred thousand dollars in a year, but believe me, it was a really happy conversation to have. With Has it closed yet, though? No. It doesn't matter. Yeah. No. 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 It's, no, 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 it's a pre sale. It's a pre sale. Yeah. 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 No. It's, it's so no, he bought it like two years ago. No. So. Yeah, I, I got him in when on phase one of the yeah. development. Yeah. And the price. And they just keep raising prices. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you, you know what's happened to prices over yeah. the past. Yeah. So. Those are fun conversations to have. If you look down your, your list, your database list of people that you helped one year ago, two years ago especially, and longer, mm -hmm. those are really easy and fun calls to make when you get to tell them how much money they're up. Mm -hmm. I mean, who wouldn't want to know that they're up that much money? And I always like throwing in like the tax-free comment. Right, yeah, it's yeah, great. Because it's, it's one of the beautiful, yeah. beautiful gifts that the government of this country gives us is the tax-free disposition of your primary residence. Mm -hmm. It's nice, so, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's we got on lead gen by what's not yeah, happening. Sorry. Determining your hourly rate, so it's GCI divided by fifty, so fifty weeks a year. 
and then I divide it by 40 and 40, just, just for some quick math. And that lets us know basically what hourly what our hourly rate is, and then you work out the hourly rate of an admin. So I think quick math says an hourly rate of an admin working forty thousand dollars a year is twenty bucks an hour. So fifty thousand would be twenty bucks. Okay, so we basically know. Like it, just, just work out your own hourly rate. I don't need to know what it is, but let's let's just assume someone makes I don't know one hundred and fifty a year. Their hourly rate is going to be about eighty. Call eighty five dollars. Either eighty three or eighty seven, but let's say eighty five. Split the difference, and your admin's making twenty five. So we have a sixty dollar gap between what an admin would make per hour, what an admin would make, and what we would make. So anything that is keeping us out of our dollar productive activities, which is our lead gen, our lead follow up, our going on showings, you know, negotiating contracts, anything like that, is costing us sixty bucks an hour. Every hour spent doing that, we're, we're basically taking 60 bucks, lighting it, and throwing it up in the air. And a lot of people struggle with, with thinking that way. Myself included, I, I remember struggling with it like, when I was told by my OP, you need to hire someone. I'm like, uh, I can't do that. What do you mean? Because you just look at this you know, $40,000 year price tag or something big and think, if I made $40,000 less, that's not good. You just picture yourself in your mind just throwing $40,000 out the door. But really, you're not doing that. You can hire part-time, you can hire virtual assistants, which are even cheaper than, than this by launch, they're about a third of this. Um, and, and yet, you just you really need to focus on, on, on what the actual cost is. So if I said to you, you've got to hire someone, generally people think, well, if it doesn't work out, I lost $40,000 this year. Well, no, because you're really only going to practice this for one month, maybe two. It's not losing $40,000 to experiment. You know, it could be sixteen hundred dollars or twenty five hundred dollars until you figure it out, which is a much more acceptable loss. Assuming you got everything completely wrong when you hired someone, you assuming didn't follow any. You didn't go through career visioning. Assuming you didn't do thirty sixty ninety. Yeah. Which everybody should. Do. You went to hire your friend because you liked him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Versus actually putting someone through an interview process and whatnot. And believe me, I'll tell you about it. I made that mistake several times. I've had one, two. So I had four admins or operations people before I finally got it right. And I'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll say I got this one right. They've been absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. They've completely changed everything. Like uh, people in in the team will ask questions, and I'll be getting ready to answer, and they'll say, no, because this do do do. And I went, yeah, he's right. Like he's he's heavily involved in the business. He knows so he gets involved. Yeah. Yeah, he's 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 quite good. He's very. very Is he licensed? No. no, no. He's 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 a very unique individual. Like he's almost a lawyer now. He's been doing his legal degree on the side just because oh. he likes learning, not because he's going to become a lawyer. Oh. So he's taking correspondence out of school in London. Like he's a very very unique cat. But even when I hired him, I put him through I think five or six rounds of interviews. And every time I sat down with him, it was for two to three hours. Minimum. It's because I messed it up so many times before. I wanted to have someone that understood me, I understood them, and they understood my particular brand of crazy. We're all a little bit nuts in our own special way, right? <laughs> like we all have our own tendencies, and I'm quirky in my way, and you're quirky in your way. And I just wanted to make sure that A, I, I liked them, and I could work with them, and I could trust them, and vice versa. I needed them to understand, like, some days I'm like this, some days I'm like this. I, I just, and I, I really. I didn't hide anything from the beginning. A lot of people, I think, when we interviewed people, I say, well, here's how my business runs. And it doesn't run that way. It's how we want it to run, right? We, we, we put on this, this facade almost of what we're going to be, and we say that's how we are, and we're not. So when they come in, they go, what, what the hell is this? This is not at all what I was from. So I mean, I made a point. Like, some days I roll into the office when I know I don't have clients. I got shorts and a golf shirt on. I haven't shaven. And, and I sat with him one day. I said, look, this is how I come in sometimes. Because he was coming from a very white collar, Sort of tie environment, and I said, This is different than where you were. You're working down on Bay Street, you're coming in here. This is your guy that you have now. This is my guy. But where did you fail on the first couple? <laughs> That's Everywhere. Like all other seven. Everywhere. <laughs> I, one, I, I took someone that was sort of at me, someone said, Here's a solution. I said, Great, took her. <laughs> and, and for at the time, she worked out for a period of time, but as you grow, you can grow. Um, another one I hired my brother for a while. That was great. However, it's really hard for me. I'm 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 very hard driving. I'm 
I sometimes come across as emotionless and I just go, 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 go. For me, it's, it's just constant action. And that can be really hard on the people around me if I'm not, if I'm not careful with it. Yeah, is everyone familiar with the DISC, the IFC? Starting to become familiar with Okay, so there's drive, interpersonal sociability, and then your, basically your analytical nature. I have none of the middle two. I have no sociability, and I have no interpersonal. I'm all D and I'm all analytical, so I'm a robot that wants to go faster, and that doesn't work well with a lot of people. Um, but the thing is, when you know that, you know it. Yeah. That's what the disc is good for. Yeah, it is. It's good for people to, under, to understand you. It's not that I don't like anyone. It's just the way my mind works. It's, it's more computerish, and and I mean, most other people, most people want to go up and, and give hugs or be super social. I'm quite happy to be alone and just pull out a spreadsheet and, and play around. And that's that's my fun. So I'm, I'm a little different than that. Um, so we've got our hourly rate. Now we have to determine our weekly work hours. Now this is a unique concept and not one that we usually get into. How long is, I mean, you've been in business, what, 17 years now? 27. 27 years, that was off by a decade. I started it's when close. I was 10. Close, actually, you know, I should, I can't even believe <laughs> that I said 17. I've been here 10 years now. Okay. I remember your first bolt. Yeah, yeah. 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 You're with Keller Williams, you did 10 years? Uh, 10 years in the business, 10 years with Keller, 10 years everything. Okay. Yeah, this, it was the first. Where did that all how many years have you been in it? When did that I have been in it since 2012, yeah. full time. 2012, full time. Okay, yes. with KW, oh, so that's uh, not even a year yet. Not a year. Okay. And how long have you been in the business for? 33 years. So a little while. Yeah. You've been around. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what I found personally, and this may not be the same thing for everyone, but I, I find in the beginning, and probably always for a lot of people, you feel like you need to always say yes to your clients. Yeah. You feel like if they want to go see something, yeah. that, that you have to drop everything. And sometimes that comes to the detriment of family or personal time or it can come with anything. And what I found personally is that over time, if I let someone else dictate my life for a long period of time, I get resentful. Right? You're missing out on your family time, you're missing out on a great social party because these Clients want to go see this place. I haven't made an offer in forever, and, and <laughs> it can be frustrating. And you just you kind of have that sour taste in your mouth. Or, or whenever you're not in control of your own life, I find for me personally, it, it tends to read a little resentment. Now, if I say to myself, James, you're gonna to have to suck up Monday through Wednesday this week. You are gonna be going from 8 a.m. till 8 p.m. if people need you. I can say to that, okay, you know, I can walk in mentally knowing that. That happens, and if I have to make an offer, have to make an offer. Yeah. But if I'm making an offer and it goes past that, there's a high chance I'm going to be okay with that, right? Yeah. Because yeah. because yeah. I, I'm moving the ball forward. Yeah. Yeah. I've got goals. I hit certain goals, transaction goals, yeah. GCI goals, whatever they are, and I can go forward from there. If all of a sudden you know clients call me and say, you know, I want to spend all Sunday with you, and I was planning on on going to see my friends or spending the day with my daughter, and all of a sudden I feel like I can't do that, there's going to be trouble. Mentally, not, not real trouble. Um, so I think there, there's two aspects here. One, you can set hours to keep yourself happy because I think the, the happier you are, you're going to be able to, uh, to do better in the business because you're going to attract, attack it with positivity. If you're going into the office, you go you know, grumbly, grumbly, it's not good. So you, know, you have to determine the hours you want to work. And I think if you clearly communicate that to your clients ahead of time, saying, hey, you know Sundays? I will let you know about all the open houses on Sunday that you want to go see. And if there's anything you can't make it into, no problem. We'll go see it on Saturday because I'm available from 2 to 4 on Saturday. Or we can see it throughout the week or we can see it the following week, whatever's up to you. If you give them your schedule and you're mentally prepared to work those hours, I generally find that, that I'm okay. And your clients are pretty understanding too. Like, we're humans, right? We get a day off here. Now, if there's a 911 and someone submitted an offer, a bully offer on a property and, and you've got to go for two, then sometimes are the breaks. But here's where leverage comes in. If you know that your clients are interested in the property, but they didn't want to bully offer it, you know, you've got an assistant. Can they not draw up an offer on Thursday for a presentation next Tuesday? All you got to do is key in the price. If they can get you 90% of the way there, so if a bully does happen, you can tell your clients to go get the bank draft now, so that if a bully happens, you're protected. Because if you're like me, you wait till about six o'clock before you call the other agent and say, "Hey, I got an offer for you." And all the banks are closed. Knock on wood, except for TD and hate that they're open. <laughs> But, so for me, I, I like to get aggressive that way and, and try it. And if your clients don't have the bank draft, you're kind of left yeah. in the cold, right? And you missed, and then we'll get back in that whole resentment thing. 
But that's all on us, that's all. So with leverage, we can have our admins drop the offers for us. We can tell them to get the bank draft ready. Or if we're if we're big enough, you know, when we're when our clients say, you want to see the properties on Sunday, we can say to our showing assistant, hey, we got some albums to go see this Sunday. And so while you're at home spending time with your family, or you're off on the golf course, you're off doing whatever makes you happy, your showing assistant can be out taking care of those things for you. And your clients don't have to suffer at all. So again, this morning I had a showing assistant come let go out and and cover showing for me. Um, I didn't want to say no to this client, but I didn't have to. Yeah. Just for that reason. So that's where leverage comes in is the bigger you build that business, within reason. Um, Did they get danger pay today? They get danger pay today. <laughs> no, there was no danger pay in the contract. <laughs> hey, if I could make it into Burlington Hamilton, they could make it to the side of the city. It's okay. <clears throat> and the last thing is we determine what we need to pay someone on an hourly basis. So again, we, we figured it's a 25 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour, but when we know the gap. That's our profit, right? Is everything in between. A mistake a lot of people make is they hire an assistant. They go, I don't have to do trade records anymore. This is great. I have all this extra time. And they play solitaire. What to do? <laughs> you know, something else. The whole point of hiring someone is not so you have to work less. It's so that when you do work, you work just as much, perhaps even harder, but you do it on things that move the needle, right? They're, they're move, move the business forward. I just freed up two hours a day. There's two more hours of lead gen. People go, oh, lead gen? Right? Yeah, you don't like lead gen, but how do you feel about money? Yeah. Well, good. Well, guess what? You know, it's, it's like, oh, I want to be really, really fit and like, you know, have a really great body for beach season in the summer. You going to go to the gym? No. no. I just want it to happen. It, it doesn't work like that, right? Lead gen is, is fitness for our business. And just the same as working out is fitness for our bodies. Just out of curiosity, do, are the other companies stressing lead gen? I have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, they do. Okay, do it. Okay. I think everyone inherently yeah, knows that lead generation in any business, in any business. Yeah, it's not true. We never talked about it. Hardly ever talked about it. With who? That's not true. I think with, with yeah. any company, no matter what the industry that, yeah. is, you're yeah. needing to lead generate for yeah. business. Like, I can open up my doors and have the greatest product in the world, but if I'm not going out telling people about it or, or look, you know, talking, knocking the doors and talking to people that could use my product, yeah. I'm not going to sell nearly as much. If you just got your real estate license, you know, came up, walked in the brokerage, they'd like to join here, they say, great, you signed the paperwork, you went up, you parked yourself in the bullpen. Mm -hmm. How long before the phone rang? <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's yeah, not going to happen, right? Yeah. You have to go up there and you yeah. start turning over those rocks until you find something. Great, put it away, great, put it away. And that's what it is. You will grow over time really slowly just by being social and people knowing that you're an agent. However, if you're going to be sitting in this office for 40 hours a week, really great to make you know as much business as you could while you're in here rather than just killing time in an mm -hmm. office because I'm gonna kill time I'm gonna go hang out with my daughter mm -hmm. I'll have fun that way if I'm gonna waste my time it's not wasted that way I'm, I'm enjoying myself it's, it's fulfilling me if I'm gonna be away from her I'm gonna be here <clears throat> my philosophy personally is I'm either working or flying everything in between like all the administrative stuff that's that's work but let me rephrase it's either I'm making money or I'm playing because if I'm filling out paperwork, I'm filling out trade records, it's not, I'm not making money. You're working on a flyer, it's not making money. No, any of that stuff is not making me money. So I'm doing not BS work, but just work that I, that I, that I shouldn't be doing. That's someone else's job. Okay. So if I treat my life that way, and you can treat all of life this way, by the way. Like for a period of time, I had an assistant at home that would literally come in, make my bed, do my laundry, did my grocery shopping for me. Um, they renewed my license plate stickers for me. Like, like literally everything. So I didn't have to do anything other than. You had a wife. Goes <laughs> this is after the wife, actually. Yeah, but yes. It's a bad wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this one wasn't as expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we talked about the five things that you need to be working on. These are the only five things that you do. This is your money zone. You lead generate, you lead follow up, you go on appointments, you negotiate contracts, and you practice your scripts. If you're doing this and you're only doing this, this is your fastest ticket to the biggest business that you have or that you can achieve. Nothing in here, you know, those trade records aren't in here. You, you notice that you know designing new business cards isn't on here. You know, Facebooking isn't on here. Right? These are this is Monday to Friday, kind of nine to five or nine to nine, whatever our work days are, depending on the day on the schedule that you choose and you set and you inform your clients of what it's gonna be. 
this is what we're doing. You're going to apply to Trojan Homes, great. Now, why do we script practice? So you don't practice with your clients. Yeah, so you don't lose money. Essentially, it's, it's yeah. what it was. Yeah. Gary Keller at Mega Camp a few years ago. He has Mega Camp. Mega Camp Factory. He has Mega Camp. He said, someone asked, you know, what would you do to build the perfect real estate agent? And he gives it you. It's easy. And everyone's just waiting. Like, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? He said, I put him in a room with a script book. I I'd say to them, don't come out until you know everything cool. I'll close the door. And he said, when they emerged from that room and they knew every single script that I gave them cold, he'd say, he put him in the next room and said, great, there's a phone. Get on it, start calling. So he'd get him scripted and they'd have him generating. And, and don't come out until you know, you've got so much business you don't know what to do with. And he, he started applying the leverage models after that. But I find whenever we're lead generating, or even whenever we're going to listing appointments, if you're going to a listing appointment not felt entirely confident, mm -hmm. or, or you go in there and you're like, oh, there's just something holding you back. You just don't feel right about either lead generating or you don't feel right about going after that listing or helping out that buyer. It always comes down to, like if you boil it all down to, I don't know what I'm talking about or I don't feel confident in what I'm talking about. Right, so lead generation is just practice so you know what to say. And really, for me, script practice comes down to, there's script practice and there's continuing education. So what you guys are, let's say, doing here today, learning, growing is important, but it's not just important to learn and grow about your business, it's important to learn and grow about the industry. So it's understanding you know, changes in, in financing rules, so when your clients come along to you and they ask you questions, you can talk with a reasonable degree of information about how financing works. You don't have to be an expert, that's what the mortgage brokers are for, but you should understand what they do. Mm -hmm. I had someone try and buy a property the other day, an investment property with 5% down. I said, no, let's get a CMHC financed. Mm -hmm. well, it's a non-owner occupied property. He's like, yeah, CMHC. Like, no. <laughs> And so they went out and they went to the mortgage broker and they couldn't get financing. Like, when you know, if it was not owner occupied property, like, I, I don't get it. Why? And, and it, it baffled my mind that they did not know that you had to put 20% down on a home you weren't living in. It's, or someone trying to put 5% down on a home. Was it their first time investing? They've been an agent for 10 years. I don't oh, know. Agent. Oh, this was an agent. It was an agent. Oh, oh, oh I see. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly my reaction. So, so there's, there's a great example. Like, if you, on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of knowledge, you're sitting at about a 50. That means every time your client asks you a question, you're right half the time, you're wrong half the time. That's not an agent that's going to inspire a lot of confidence. And it's not an agent that's going to have a lot of confidence when talking with their clients. If your knowledge base is up around 98, like if you're wrong two times out of 100, it's not perfect, but you feel a hell of a lot better than you did when you were sitting down at 50. So like practicing your scripts gets you confident in what you're saying, and increasing your knowledge base gets you confident also in what you're saying. You just know how to say it once you're scripted. So when you're going in, you know, if I were to say go on a listing appointment right now, the bridal path, I wouldn't feel as confident as if I was going on a, on a listing appointment on a condo downtown or a, um, or a, let's say a, a listing in Westville, where I know things a little bit more and more familiar with the history. However, you know, who's the big bridal? Max Taylor and Barry Cohen are they're two guys that do a fair amount of business in the bridal path. I know them both, and they're smart guys. Yet I don't think there's anything so special about them that they can acquire knowledge in some way that I can't. If I sat down and I studied it, I could learn about the past sales, I could understand more about what people are looking for. But that's up to me to, to raise my game. And for me, I treat, if I, if, I, like if I suck at a certain part of the business or if there's something I'm comfortable with, I treat it the way I would an injury to the body. If an athlete sprains his ankle, he can't just go and start playing again. You need to fix that ankle. If you're getting beat up every time you go on listing presentations, you need to address your listing presentation like it's a, like it's a sprained ankle or something like that. When that's fixed, you can start going on listing presentations and you might say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm now injured here, but I'm working with buyers on condos. I don't know what I'm talking about, or this is going wrong. Great, you found your next injury that you need to fix. Because mm -hmm. this is an injury to your business, it's not an injury to, to obviously personally. And if you just keep rehabbing and fixing those injuries, and you're continuing to work on your scripts, and you're continuing to, to learn and grow yourself, you now you're strengthening yourself. So you fixed all your injuries, and now you keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You're less likely to, to quote unquote get injured. You just become a, a consummate professional, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then when you're that way, you are not going to have any hesitation when you go and talk to your clients. You're going to say, yes, I know exactly what I'm talking about. Let me tell you how it works. And you're going to communicate that with so much confidence that they're going to feel the confidence from you, and they're going to believe in you more than the other agent that they just met with. Similarly, too, when I talk about setting your hours and understanding, so 
what your hours are so you don't get dragged out into appointments where you don't feel good and you feel like grumbly grumbly or resentful about the fact you have to go on those appointments. Um, if you keep yourself in a happy place, if you say, yeah, I'm going to work today, it's going to be a long day, but I'm good with that, and you get pulled out on a listing appointment or something like that, pulled out like it's an like yeah. off thing to go on a listing appointment, um, you're going to be much happier. And when you're going into an appointment much happier and you're confident, like everything starts to get better. And the funny thing is, it doesn't actually take much to get script practiced up to a point where you can be head and shoulders about the competition. It doesn't take much where you can be knowledgeable, you know, head and shoulders above a lot of other agents. Understand that the barrier to entry into this industry is very low. And people keep saying, oh, they should, they should raise the standards. They should raise the standards to get in. And it, you know, people say, people want them to raise the standards to keep more people out. But the reality is, if you raise the standards, the people that are coming in are better. Mm -hmm. so true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's really easy to be tall in a land of like short people. If everyone that starts coming in is super, super tall, mm -hmm. it's harder for you to stand out and look better. Right. So just, just keep that in mind. And if you're not continuing to, to, to increase your knowledge base and continue to script practice, you're getting shorter and shorter while the people around you are getting taller and taller. So just because you were great last year, if you stop improving and you stop growing, you're actually going to start losing ground. You may not see it for one or two years, but then the amount of work to recover and get back on that upward trajectory is phenomenal. You need to make this a part of your daily routine, and that's why I say script practice and even continuing education along with that. It's hyper, hyper important. Okay. So what work to get rid of? We determine our hourly rate, lifestyle and goals, because we know what hours we want to work, we know what we want to do with our time. And we need to determine if everything we're doing is contributing to the bottom line for the conversation about dollar productive activities. If it's not in those top five things, we give it away. Here are the things that we tend to fill our time with. Right? These are all the administrative tasks, you know, calendar management, scheduling appointments, um, filing all your trade records and stuff online, booking your travel range and a family reunion, ordering office supplies, following up on outstanding invoices or paying invoices, a resume screening for new hires. Like this, you know, we can go on and on and on about this stuff, but this is the stuff we get trapped in. And we get trapped in it because it feels really good to start knocking stuff off to-do lists. It's, it's, I can knock 10 things off the to-do list if this is my to-do list pretty quickly. That feels good to get stuff done. If my to-do list is to lead generate 20 contacts, I can take hours and I've made one check mark for hours worth of work. But it's a whole conversation about product, productive work versus kind of busy work. Right? And we want to make sure that we're focusing on the productive work in those five buckets that we discussed earlier. And this is all stuff. So in my particular model, you guys know that I have two VAs, or excuse me, you know that I have two buyer's agents slash showing assistants, and I have Daniel, who's my head of my operations. What I haven't told you yet is I've got two virtual assistants that roll up into Daniel, one a transaction coordinator, and the other one is kind of an assistant to me who can also be do everything the transaction coordinator does. So one starts at 8 in the morning, actually one starts at 6 in the morning, um, the first thing they do in the day is they send me an email, and the email has a certain set of links, so I know everything that's happening. Do you guys get all the showing requests for your, for your listings? Mm -hmm. I don't. I hate it. I hate getting like way too many emails a day, but what I do get is the next day, I have a link that I click, so when I go to the gym, you know, between sets or something, I'm catching my breath, I click the link, and I'm breathing heavy, and I can see that we had this many showings on the property, I can see how long it's been listed at the price point for, and I can see what the agent feedback was. And my VAs actually call and get agent feedback for me. From everyone, they ask three questions. One is your client going to make an offer on this property? And if the answer is yes, and people shut up and they're done, they let me know. If the answer is no, say great. What about the property didn't work for your client? So we now know that why the client didn't like the property. And the third and final question, because there's only three questions, is how do you feel about the price? We now know if it's priced too high or too low, we know what's wrong with it. And if the people are going to make an offer, we don't need to know the other two things. So that's still indirectly from Chris Heller, by the way. I didn't, didn't invent that, but it works. Um, so I've got that report. Um, I have a few other reports. I get a bunch of other links. I can see how the response time for the people on my team um, to inbound leads. Uh, I can see how many calls they made yesterday. And so it just allows me to track by looking at some scorecards. Because so often we have to go in and say, well, how is this person doing? Or how's that person doing? I have it at my fingertips every single day, and I train my VAs on what reports to pull. Um, from there, they all might, if one goes on vacation, they can backfill each other. They both know how to do transaction management. They both know how to load those things. They both know how to write all the offers or compose all the offers. And again, they don't write the offers and send them off to clients for me. But what they'll do is they'll, they'll write the offer. They'll get it 95% of the way there. I'll review it. I'll put a quick finishing touch on it sometimes. If, if I say, oh, you know what? 
that place has a pool, so I got to throw in a pool inspection clause, or uh, that's an termite area, I should make a you know a quick phone call. Those are the types of things that, that I'll kind of finish up and offer with, and I'll say great, send it off to the client because once it's all edited and done, and then they can go right and authenticize. Do you guys know how authenticize works with the skins? You can yeah. basically put all the initial blocks wherever you want them, so yes. they'll drop an offer in, and if you just on the, the drop down list of skins. They'll say James Benson Group standard offer 2018, and it takes both buyer's name, puts all the initials in all the right places, drops it all through the offer with one click. Oh, I didn't know that. And they they push it right. Compared to the, the DocuSign. That's on the or the. DocuSign does it too. It's available in DocuSign as well. I think DocuSign can actually be better because if you build the templates, I believe in DocuSign you can share them with whoever you want. Oh, the templates. <laughs> yeah. So it's, anyway, it's called them. So, but, but anyway, these guys do all of it. They post social media for me. Um, I don't have Instagram on my phone, but if, if you guys are on my Instagram account, if you see it, you'll see that you know just listeds get posted there all the time. I don't touch it. I don't have anything to do with it. it these are all your main people. What they do? It's all coming out of the Philippines. It's all coming out of the my Philippines. My desk? No, 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 no. Uh, my real CPA. So they're these people are specifically real estate training BAs. They're trained on how to use Trev. They'll pull comps for me on condos. They'll, they'll, they know how to pull comps on detached homes versus semi-detached homes. So for example, if I'm writing an offer, if I'm going to a listing presentation, which they prepare for me, because they've created a standard thing, they'll give me, let's say, 10 to 15 comps, and then I'll narrow it down from those 10 or 15. But they know if I'm going in for semi-detached, that I want to see all semi-detached as well as row houses in the area. Um, they know how to work you know, the grids and do the map searches and things like that. And again, every bit of geography through the city can be a little bit different, so you always have to go in and check, say, when they pull those comps, were they looking in the same area I would have looked? Say, no, of those 20, I can only use 14. Okay, great. And from those 14, I'll narrow it down. But they can do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So I, I equate it to being a rock star. You know, you walk on stage, grab the mic, and you go. So do they have um, the, the trim thing? Yeah. Do you buy it for them? Or do they have to they provide it Well, no, I'll, they'll just say, like, I got a text on the way here saying, hey, can I get access to your trip? Oh. And so they know the first the first two numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'll say, sure. Yeah, yeah, so you you, you got to click on and give it to them. Right, so you've got the authenticator, yeah. right? Yeah. In the, uh, yeah. Um, on the far side, yeah. I take a screenshot and I text it over to them. It's only doing it for three seconds, though. No, so no, it's, it's good for a minute. Oh, you can, you, and you can actually watch it counting down, so oh, I can yeah. see how. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it how my, my real VA? Is that what you said? MRVA. I'll, I'll have the info for you guys at the back of this. Oh, I did that. Yeah, I think I know that one. It's a possible, or it's it's obviously. Uh, I'm starting to re-upping my parking here. Yeah. Okay, I'm not doing this with the ticket on the shield. There we go. Okay. Um, Okay, so yeah, they handle absolutely everything for me, right down to sending the closing debts. So like we've got it all sourced from, from a certain supplier. So really, start to finish, my only job now is to deal with those, those five buckets. You know, occasionally you do get roped into other conversations from time to time, but I can slot those conversations generally in, in a given week. So I'll know, let's say Friday from 1 to 2, I'm going to sit down with Daniel. And I'm going to go over anything that we need to be working on, any projects we have that we feel are going to move the business forward or, or allow us to attract more agents. And that's the conversation we're having now is, is that value proposition conversations. You know, how can we start bringing in more agents and making sure that we're providing them the value that they need? And so right now it's about setting up you know, three times a week you know, team meetings slash little mini coaching sessions, group coaching sessions, in addition to all the one-on-ones. -on -ones. I'm sort of setting the schedules list for that now and, and just making sure that, that we can start to attract talent and bring in the people that we want to bring in that of course fit our culture. So, but it, it's, it's, it's insane to me that if I go back to even four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, the fact that I was able to get this going, get it built to this point was huge. Because this, like if you think about this, imagine letting go of absolutely all of this. It's a little bit scary and a little bit daunting to think about how to train people on how to do this. But once you figure out how to do it, because I hate, I hate training people. I don't mind doing it once, but let's um, understand that I've been through a few assistants over yeah, the years. Yeah. So you do it once, you get yourself up. It's like getting yourself on a bike and you're going, you're going, you're going, and you have a wipeout and you've got to like dust yourself off and like throw a little alcohol on your scrapes and it hurts and it stings and it's awful and then you've got to get going again. You gotta get going, yeah. And so it's and so we've now been able to, to build the catalog, and, and again, I've got redundancy so that if, let's say I didn't have a VA to quit, 
the other one is right there to fill in, and all I do is backfill the other VA. Because it's nine bucks an hour. Is it nine? Yeah. It's like, and, and they overlap minimally. So the one goes, like I said, from six in the morning till about two in the afternoon, and the other one goes from noon till eight. So I've got coverage from 6 a.m. to get stuff going until the end of the day. And so there's lots of things I can have them do. Yes, they can do the usual transaction records for me, but they can keep calling for feedback. They can fill the trade records. Like we did over 350 deals last year. It's a lot of trade records. A lot of stuff that needs to happen. So, you know, and you know, get the social media ads going, get the closing ads going. All this stuff can actually work. They can reach out to the other agent, get the lawyer info. Like when agents send me, you know, emails now about, oh, can you send me your lawyer info for your, for the deal? I just forward it off to, to Joyce or Christina, depending on what's going on, and, and they know from reading it what to do. It took a little bit to get there, but mm -hmm. but now that we've got everything built, it's it's fine. It's it's really, really nice. It's when we look at the economic model in the MRBA is we're only supposed to spend a certain amount on salaries for admin. It's really hard to spend that little in a market like Toronto where people command you know, higher salaries because it's more expensive here to live, et cetera. So I found this VA model to be an incredible model for that. And, and the warm fuzzy of it for me is um, I've hired two women. The national wage in that country is like a dollar fifty. They're making, I don't know what they're making, they're making a lot more than that. They've actually become the breadwinners of their house while taking care of like one and two year old kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they can sit there and they can work away you, know, so you said that numbers. these uh, VR agents, these are trained? Yeah, they tra train them and they database train them. Like for example, the like follow up boss is the main database they use. Top producer can be a little a little uh, advanced, I think, for some, but like creating PowerPoints and things like that or creating like if you just go down, I think it's James Bed's group or James Bed's group one, if you look at the Instagram, they create all of these these little Instagram posts that go out and things like that. I don't think I literally haven't touched it in I don't know how long. So it just need that they can go and, and do all those things. Ordering for sale signs on the ground, booking the photography, making sure the staging appointments are coordinated with the sellers to when they go in and out. Like all this stuff is absolutely absolutely handled. Now they have to ask me, what are we listing the home for? Mm -hmm. What commission are we offering on the buy side? What commission are you taking when they're when they're prepping the forms? Um, but they know what the standard amount is and they just check, is there any deviation from the standard? No, great, thanks guys. But all this stuff, it all takes. So sending everything off to the MCA is like all your trade records and things like that, chasing it all down. It, it's so relieving not to have to deal with that stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, and that's the whole point of leverage is you get out of the stuff you don't want to do, that's right. so you can focus on the stuff you do do that will move you forward. How long have you had the girls on the VR? Yeah. Two years now. Christina was newer, so Christina I probably had for nine months to a year. I added the second one because I wanted redundancy in case something ever happened. Um, and I wanted, and Joyce had to move from from 12 to 8. She was usually a 9 to 5-ish for me. She needed to move 12 to 8 for personal reasons. So I just brought in someone for the other time and everything worked because I was able to get more out of them and I had redundancy. It worked for me. Some people might only need one. And one VA at 9 bucks an hour, it's come pretty well trained. It's like, there's no CPP. There's no EI, there's, there's none of those things on top of all that. You don't have to file the forms of the government. Like it just, one invoice, done, thank you so much, see you later. <laughs> it's nice, it's a really nice thing. And we can keep our ratios in line with the MREA economic models, which is great. Okay, so types of leverage, there's three things. There's one, there's the people leverage, who's going to do it? There's the systems, how are they gonna do it? And then there's the tools, which is what are they gonna do it with? Okay, so, you no know, small example. When they call for feedback, me, everything goes into a tracking sheet. So that would be a system, right? And even a tool, I guess. So my VA is the who. They're going to call the other agents and get the feedback. And they know the three questions to ask. That's the system of, of calling for feedback. You know, is your client going to make an offer? What did they like? What, if not, what did they like about the property? And, and what do you feel about the price? And the tools is the, the Google sheet that's a standard sheet that allows them to record everything so that I've got access to it in real time. There's really three types of leverage there. And systems and tools, if used properly, uh, they can go so far beyond uh, so far beyond what you would think. So here's a quick example. If I'm going to go meet you to sell your house, um, there are, you know, people have pre-list questionnaires. They, you know, they talk about mailing it out or you know, they'll have a quick phone call with someone. We just created a quick little online tool created like a little landing page, just a little online survey. We send a link out to people, they click it, 
and they can just fill it out. So when I'm going in to meet them for the first time, I've got the background of why they're looking to sell. It's answering as many questions as they can. And again, I don't send this out. The people use a system I created to send that tool out to get this done. So I'm walking into every buyer presentation or for seller presentation with as much knowledge as possible. I understand why you want to sell. I understand what it's important, what it's important about selling. I understand people fill this out with different degrees of, of diligence. So sometimes I've got to push and prod and get more info. But it's those types of those three different types of leverage that allow me to get everything I need. I was the one to hire. So this comes back to the conversation we're having. If you're at the level that you want to be at, you probably don't need to hire anymore. You'll need to hire if you're feeling pain and you want to get out of that pain, or if you're wanting to grow. Those are really the only two reasons to hire. Either you're not enjoying the business and you need more time to, to just relax. Um, and decompress a little bit. I think what you'll find is when you get rid of the parts of the business that you don't like and you get to spend all your time doing stuff you do like, your energy levels will come back. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, some, so you can hire an assistant and grow, and you should. Like if you're hiring someone, let's say for 40 grand a year, Gary says you should be 10 times the 10x return off them, which is you know $440,000 off of that investment. I can't say I've, I've been, I've 10 x a couple of things, but maybe not quite. Every every piece of leverage I add is not 10 x for me, which either means A, I'm doing it wrong, or B, I'm paying too much. Um, <laughs> but it's certainly, it's certainly gone, in, and when you do the red light, green light on it to see how that expense works, I'm generally happy with everything, and if I'm not, I get rid of it pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah. But when to hire is A, when you believe it in yourself that you need to do it, and then you hire smart, and you have to decide whether you want to grow or whether you want to shrink. There's people right now that have been in the business for, for 30, 40 years, and they're winding things down. They're not in the mood to start adding more and more agents and, and, and going through the, you know, the grind of maybe building up to that fifth, sixth, seventh level team. They're going the other way, which is fine. And that's where I come back to. You need to do what's right for you and the size of business that, that, you want to, that you want to own. But really, you can make your business run as smoothly and as effortlessly as you want. I mean, if you were at the point where you just walk in, grab the mic, and sing, and walk back off stage, someone else will tear down the stage, pack up all the equipment, get it to the next city for you. Meanwhile, you go on the bus, you party, you have all the fun with your friends. You get off the bus, come into work the next morning. You get on, you do your job. Bus closes at five o'clock. You're showing to Canada all showings after five o'clock. And if you, there's an offer that needs to be done, you get called in. Great. If you need to negotiate a listing that night, you get called in. Great. Or your listing specialist gets called in at a certain point. But you can, you can literally make it so you can sprint from 9 to 5, catch your breath all night by smiling and being with the people that you want to be with. But that just depends on where you want to take your business and what you want to do. Okay, so we've determined our hourly rate, we've determined our lifestyle and goals, which again comes into our, our hours of work. And really, if we put that all together, that's, that's everything we need. This is the company um, that I talked about, my real TBA, if you guys want to take down that info. Um, so they've got part-time, full-time VAs. I think part-time, I think the hourly wage goes up a little bit because they've got to, they've got to make sure that they're paying people, I guess, full-time. Um, it's harder to get part-time work. You have to pay them a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's how that works there. But it's I mean, really at, at nine bucks an hour Canadian, not US. Mm -hmm. It's it's really efficient. It's really really. So efficient. how much the growth get paid then in India? Yeah. I know the hourly wage in that country is about yeah. fifty. They're probably making six or seven bucks. I don't know. Even if it's five, it's yeah. like yeah. not bad at all. Yeah. That's the goal. Ah, excellent. We're gonna trade spots. Trading. Yes. Yeah. Anyone have any other questions? I'm gonna write that down. So that went up because it used to be like five or six dollars now, right? Not from them. Oh Maybe. really? No, not from them. And again, the nice thing is they come trained. So. Mm -hmm. Did you did you check out my Outdesk? I thought they were. I hired my Outdesk. I oh, had I had three okay. assistants from my Outdesk, and I found this to be much better. So they're um, they're, they're in um, the Philippines as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's owned by Daniel Ramsey. Um, I know him. He was in a, I've been in a few conferences with him. Spent some time with him. Um, but I will say that this is this has been. Night day. I mean, having people that understand, like, like when your clients want to go see a home, and they've gotten into trap, 
They've called the other office, they've booked the showing, they've placed the showing in the lockbox codes into your calendar, they've taken that information, they've reached out to the client and said, you know, hey client, uh, James will meet you at this address at, at 4 p.m. If it's a condo, please wait for him in the lobby, he'll meet you there. It's a standard piece of communication, but it just goes out and you didn't do a thing. They send um, the link to all the properties right to your iPad or, or, or iPhone, so then you know, your MLS sheets, you always have them with you. Just kind of bring with you on your iPad and kind of go through it. It's nice. You never have to be in the office. You can do the showing property or just going around all day, and everything happens. They have access to my my inbox. I have two inboxes now. I've got one that's just completely private in case someone needs to send me something. They have a concern or something like that that only I can see. I probably get four or five emails in that inbox a week. Nothing much at all. And the rest, they can go through. They can clean up my emails. They can deal with certain things. If requests come in, like, hey, can you send me the status certificate for that? Take it so are you communicating uh, to them via email or are you calling them? Either or. Either or, texting, email. Yeah, generally when they need the, the, the truck codes, they'll text me and I can just take that screenshot and right. that text is the easiest way. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's been absolutely game changing for me. Yeah. It's allowed me to, to hire a higher quality operations person is how I can manage that because if I had to hire, well if I had to hire, let's say two admins at 50 a year, hundred thousand dollars out the door, right? I could pay a little bit more for the person I wanted in house because I have to pay a heck of a lot less here. I've got three admins. I've covered basically the time I get up in the morning until the day is well done. My stuff is always moving along and, and turning through. It's it's this has been the best, most stress relieving system that I've come across. And those two VAs report again into Daniel. I don't they don't report into me. So I don't even have the stress of dealing with them at all. Yeah, yeah, it's been really, really good. So then the five people on your team includes two, two of these guys? Pardon me? You said you have five on your team, that includes these two guys? These two people? Yeah, so okay. three, three assistants, um, okay. plus uh, Ken and Dan. Yeah. And then I do have people that I work with strategically, and um, other agents that I work with consistently and strategically. So there's um, a gentleman out in Mississauga, uh, David Braddock, I don't know if you guys have heard of him. I think he was. He was probably number one in the team category last year for GCI. Uh, almost. Did he? Did he? Did he just he, get dipped out? He, he. Yes. He. He ended up getting bumped out of the top five. Okay. Really? Okay. Really? Okay. Well, right. Anyway, he's so. But he. Yes. He, well, he led it all year, and it was it was sort of one big project, wasn't it? It was. There's a few there, and so I'll tell you, a lot of his income never made it onto that this year. Like he he sold another couple hundred units of pre-construction, but. Uh -huh. You know, once once we're capped, we don't fill out 300 trade records. Like, cause <laughs> there's, there's nothing more to happen. So it's we are, we're also sub brokerages, so we just send one invoice to the so regular selling, operations account stuff. So. You say you're selling a lot of pre-construction yeah. models. Yeah, yeah, that's been with all the uh, developers. Like, or do you just have a handful that you deal with primarily? Um, I've, so I've got. I have a handful that I deal with primarily that are my clients, and then I've got you know, the platinum access to, to other developers, so there's certain developers I can pick up the phone with and they'll say, you know, here's five units, ten units, twenty units, whatever you want. Um, and then this year was the first year that I started listing the entire buildings by myself, where I became the listing brokerage on those, so we've had a few of those. And this year it looks like we're going to have anywhere from 1,600 to 2,000 units of pre-construction on this year. So. The, the meeting I was late from here was coming back from Burlington. That was 311 units followed by like another 800. So, um, yeah, we're starting to grow and get to the point where it's, it's going to get really exciting. But uh, so to answer your question about the team stuff, mm -hmm. my core group that handles right. the resale side yeah. is somewhat smaller. Um, and then I just saw strategic partnerships depending on. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. And, you know, with David in particular, um, there's certain other aspects of the business that I want to get into that I'm not that strong in, but I'm leveraging him now to go and say, I need you to research this, I need you to go on it. I know him, I trust him, I've known him for 20 years, I, you know, I can hand him a bag of $10 million cash mm -hmm. and I know that I'm going to get that thing back because mm -hmm. I just, I know how he is and who he is. Um, so he's a great guy to be in business with. And, um, and yeah, so now he's, he's looking at what our next segment of investing is going to be. And it's real estate related, but it doesn't have anything to do with real estate sales. But he's starting to, to work on how we can put deals together that you know are going to really kind of jump us up to the next level. So it's, it's really really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few other agents I work with. You know, I, I bring people in. I had a big sales event in December. Um, I had Mike Weckerly from Dragon's Den, Scott McGivory speaking at the event. We had 
the, at the International Center um, down by the airport. And uh, that was a big production. Mm -hmm. We had about 35 agents that came in and helped out with that event and things like that. So whenever I get access to people, whenever I need help from people, I'll give them access to the project that, that other realtors don't have so they can broadcast it to the database. Um, so, you know, if they can work an event for me, they can go turn that into to four deals, you know, make a quick fifty to sixty thousand dollars just by giving their clients access to that event. It works so well for them, they don't mind working when they can make that much in a single day, right? So it works so well. I think our, our number one guy did eight deals by himself in one day. So that's a, that's a, those are all buys too. So if you can send email to your database and walk out on a Saturday afternoon with eight deals in your pocket, three percent commission, you're generally pretty happy. Yeah. So that's why my team is as small as it is, but we are looking at, um, at we talked about the value proposition earlier, really working that through and starting to add a lot more to the resale side of things. Okay. Any other questions? No, it's amazing. Thank you very much. Oh, no problem at all, guys. Yes, good information. Yeah, and again, I'll tell you flat out, a lot of people will sit up and say, oh, you know, this is what I did, and just do that, and you're fine. There's gonna be a lot of base plans along the way, a yeah. lot of false starts, a lot of getting it wrong, a lot of a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. But it's just one of those things where you just keep okay. I learned from that. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. If you're gonna make mistakes, I mean, there's always people you can call that can help guide in the right direction. I mean, I call Philip a lot. Like, it, it's, 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 it's slowed down. I think over the past year, you know, the longer I'm in the business, the less I, I feel the need to make the call. But you know, there's always those things you're like. I don't know what the answer to that is, but who do I know that would probably know? And, and yeah, that's a great point. But it's it's figuring those small things out. Right? But yeah, you'll step your toe along the way. Oh yeah, it's just part. Yeah, it's, it's always the fun part is figuring out how not to do that again next time. <laughs> that's right. When someone's about to do or it, or how it's painful like, it was before. Careful, because it's not going to gonna work. Yes, it will. All right. <laughs> Hurt, didn't it? <laughs> And it's funny because there's people that will warn you. I think Jerry Keller, I, I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard him say, never stop lead generating. Because you get so busy and you'll have this tendency you don't want to stop. Yeah. You'll get through all those deals and all of a sudden you go, oh, I have no more clients. And then you've got to start momentum all over again. This whole thing is just lead gen, lead gen, lead gen. When it gets hairy and crazy, hire. And deal with the deal with the chaos and higher and higher. And then you'll you'll make it up the other side. You'll, it's like the airplane taking off. I think it's the best example I've ever heard. Pushes you back in your seat, and at first it's fine because it's all nice and quiet. Your engine's cooling up, but then it starts to really get loud and take off, and it's shaky and it's bumpy. And until they pull the wheels up and you're at that cruising altitude where they can pull the engines back and you're just kind of sailing, it's, it's scary and it's loud. It's all that chaos it is just getting the business up until where you want it, until you get it to the altitude that you want, and then you cruise. You still have to watch things, you monitor the systems, and you make small little changes from them. But it's that initial horsepower. Like, I think they use like I don't fifty percent of a sort of plane's fuel, fuel is just, just takeoff. Take yeah. yeah. Right. So it's the amount of energy that goes into growing your business is phenomenal. But yeah. once you're there, maintaining it is much easier. Much, much easier. So when you're doing your lead generation, you say that you're involved in a lot of uh, media, or your team is doing a lot of media stuff. The social media stuff. Yeah, the social media stuff. Are you picking leads up from there? Is that how you're generating a lot of leads and doing your lead gen that way? So there's there's two there's two reasons we're doing. It. Yes, lead gen is a piece of it. Um, it's also proof of success. So I can't tell you the amount of people that but you know I'll, I'll see at a party or something like oh wow I saw this listing man and I'm like yeah it's great I don't know which one I'm talking about because I, I don't like again I don't look at Instagram and I, I don't know if they tell me the address or they describe it for me I can usually figure out what the heck they're talking about. Um, but yeah, it's more of the when people see you doing well, they're more likely to trust you, mm -hmm. and they're more likely to lean on you. Mm -hmm. And I want to have real estate conversations with people, right? That's part of lead gen. Yeah. So now if they're coming to me, it, it costs like nothing to post on Instagram, right? Right. So now if they're coming to me and having a real estate conversation, that time. counts as one of my contacts. Yeah. It doesn't matter that I didn't dial out to them. If I had that conversation, check the box. It's one out of one out of a hundred. Yeah. Who else wants to talk about real estate at this party? Check, 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 check. Great. Yeah. So it, those are those are the reasons I do it. A, it, it helps build credibility. P, B, it's easier to get into those real estate conversations. And then C, I don't know everyone else seems to be doing it. So, so why not? <laughs> Cost you nothing. Go for it. Yeah. So I think um, you know, for those reasons, that's that's why we, we get at it and do it. The, the, the ultimate goal, yes, is to is to get followers and, and yes. hope that they start to turn to you for that. Excellent. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, with the weather and on behalf of everybody here, uh, raising the roof is a group that we support. Uh, and you know, raising the roof too.
two to keep you warm and very head Jill. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. What's your background, Dave? Like what you did before? Uh, I worked for PepsiCo. So oh, I was, okay. um, I had a few different roles there. I was an account manager um, for Sobeys. So I would go into head office and, and negotiate all the programs for, for all the food for the year and things like that. So whenever okay. stuff goes on display or stuff gets featured in, okay. in advertisements and negotiate. Did you work by, were you on by the airport there? Uh, no, I was there before we moved to the airport. So that, that office they moved to, I think it was a couple months after I left okay. actually. So May 14th, 2010 was my first full time day in real estate. Um, was the was it, was president of Pepsi still the lady, the Indian lady then? No, right. Uh, so she still is the president of, yeah. of PepsiCo and National, Lays. I believe. Yeah, Lays. Uh, our local president um, at the time, I think, was Dave Berwick. No, no. After Dave it was a woman named Stacy, and she was Stacy was at the helm when I left. I, Rart, Riart was I think her last name. Um, but I was so started as a as a key account manager with Soviet accounts, and then oh. my last role there I was. Uh, what's called a category manager, which is a really, really fun way of saying this guy plays with spreadsheets and does a lot of analysis. Like That's I, for the analytical side. It's yeah, yeah, like it, it's, it's a problem solving thing for me. So I would walk in, for example, to the orange juice section of the store, which is a 20 foot long section. Yeah. And I would take- The Tropicana. Yeah, Tropicana, <laughs> sorry, it's Pepsi. Yeah. Right, we'd take a look at every single SKU that was carried. We'd cross reference what the stores had with what was being sold nationally and provincially and say, okay, these are the top 20 SKUs or 20 items provincially. They have 12 of the top 20 items and eight that fall out of the top 20. So unless there's real, you know, specific demographic reasons to do it, like if you're in Little India, for example, you'd want to be carrying, let's say, some, some Indian food, or if you're in Chinatown, you want to make sure you have some Chinese specialty items. Um, but I would take a look at their sales and just say, okay, well, how much are we leaving on the table? Because these items, on average, outsold these other items by this much. I could take the store's annual revenue, multiply it out, and then apply that across several different stores. So I could walk into a customer and say, hey, I found you $26 million. And they'd say, well, please tell me more. And so it was my job to go in and show them where they could make money. And it worked for Pepsi because you know Tropicana was the number one brand of orange juice. And so oftentimes, some of our, our SKUs that would outperform our competitors' SKUs were not on the shelf. So really, I was to go in objectively, and I would. But we knew that it would help us as a business I was able to go in and show like, hey, this other stuff's kind of going, we've got to go in, and, and here's why. I could sell with fact, mm -hmm. and it would all make sense, so. That type of stuff I liked. I hated the actual like grinding through the spreadsheets, but yeah. the conceptual nature of, okay, let's do this, 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 and kind of rolling off, I really, really like that. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. It's the same way that, you know, real estate investment, I don't know if you've ever gotten into that or got your clients into it. There's a great way to multiply your database. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because your client doesn't need to move doesn't mean they shouldn't be buying investment property. Right. Yeah. You're not moving, it's okay. Time to buy some more mm -hmm. properties. Because, yeah. like, you know, if you lead with that conversation we talked about earlier, saying, hey, you made $400,000 in, you know, in the past three years, tax free money, good for you. The next conversation is, you know, do you want me to show you how to do even more of that without moving? Well, yeah. Because they can pull money out of the equity of their home, put it down as a down payment on, on another piece of investment property. Someone else is going to pay for that investment property for them. And that, that debt that they put on their home now becomes tax deductible. So the primary residence now became a tax deductible mortgage, or a portion of them became yeah, tax deductible. Yeah, sure. And the other piece of investment property they bought, you know, I joke and I say, if I buy investment property, I'm buying it 80% off. Because I put down 20 and the tenant put down the other 80. Like, if, I, if I walked in a room with people and say, here, wants to buy piece of property 80% off, everyone would be, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but we know how to do it. Yeah. But we, we just don't think about it. Yeah. And so investing in real estate. Yeah, yeah, but it used to be 100% off. Yeah, and here's the thing. <laughs> and if it crashes, yeah. who cares? Because yeah. the tenant's going to be in there yeah. paying the That's mortgage right. yeah. the entire yeah. time. Yeah. yeah, and then eventually it all comes back to real estate. Like, well, who, who, who was, was it Glenn McQueen that said, um, if, if, if everybody bought the, the worst house in Toronto for the last 20 years, yes. you'd be happy. <laughs> yeah, right. And, 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 and if it was worth piece of shit in Toronto, yeah. you'd be you, happy. You just yeah. have to buy yeah. real estate and let someone else pay for it. Yeah. If you're gracious enough to let someone else buy your yeah. house for you, Yeah. You'll be fine. Yeah. But that's, that's really helpful. I did a, I did a, uh, it. I did a, a work. Primarily, you do that with all the pre construction stuff, right? I do a lot with pre construction stuff. Okay. So, a lot of the pre construction stuff we sell now, we've actually packaged it up to help people where we've got, we'll have the, we'll have the, the property, we'll guarantee a minimum amount of rent, we'll manage putting the tenant okay. in. I was just at a Hirsch uh, seminar yesterday. Yeah. Because yeah. I've done a few of the Hirsch. Have you? Yeah. Okay, make sure about your email address then, because like, all of our stuff right now that we're going to be launching for the next six months is all all set up like that. We've got guarantees in some places from two to five years. Okay. So it's like your tenant or your clients just go, 
Okay, um, the last one of these we did, we were selling them for 185,000 per. They're now selling for 330, like two years later. Like yeah. it just, it's just, and it's a great way to make money. And the price points are so low, people can't afford necessarily investment in real estate in Toronto. Mm -hmm. But if I said, here's a great cash flow property for 400 grand, you go, huh? You can't get that here. Yeah, it's just exactly. That's that's right. Right. Yeah. So what were you saying? Uh, no, I was just uh, uh, stepping back a second. Uh, we done a, a wealth creation seminar here for agents and, and for the admin staff. And just for shits and giggles, I went through MLS and pulled out 12 properties that were on the market that were under $110,000 that, that rent at a point where it, they would carry themselves and be cash flow positive. Cash flow so, so whenever anybody says you can't do it in Toronto, you know, I'm, I'm jumping and saying you can, you're just never going to want to live there. Yeah. And who cares? Well, and so you, you can't even do Toronto and you could want to live there. And the only reason I say that is I accidentally lucked into one. I bought a home. I, like I closed on it two weeks ago. And about two weeks out from, I planned to gut and rent out the whole thing and just make that my place. And I realized it was three story detached. The basement was as good height, like seven feet. It has a separate entrance. It's a legal duplex. And I went, I don't know why it didn't hit me when I was buying it. Like it should have smacked me in the face. But when I sat there and looked back at, if I renovate this thing and then add, and then looked at market rents, a single cash flow, three thousand dollars a month. <laughs> so I'm looking at it going. Well, I could live in the top two floors, have a twelve hundred square foot apartment, and I live for free. Yeah. And when I move out, so I'm going to renovate it now as my primary residence. I'm going to get it reappraised when it's done. <coughs> set the new the new high water mark after after renovation. So when I do dispose of it, you know, bought it in a million. Let's say it's worth a million six, million seven when it's when it's done. Mm. Um, that would be my tax-free point. And everything past that, I'll pay tax on. But I, I'm going to get the renovation left tax-free. Mm -hmm. so. And how are you doing that? Sorry, I missed that part. It was the best. I can't repeat it. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's tax-free tax. It's tax-free tax deductible either way. So. Uh, well, yes, but your profit wouldn't be. You, you pay capital gain on it. So yeah, you know, instead of paying 25% yeah. on the lift, I, you know, so 25% on, let's say, 500,000 dollars lift, it's still extra 125 in my pocket. If you have an extra 125 laying around that you want to get rid of, oh, I see. I'm yeah. here. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> but no, I just I, I happened to find a, a three-story detached that I was going to buy for myself, and then realized just you know a couple of weeks after closing that way, and then I could try flex this thing. And when I ran the rents, it's just it's three thousand dollars a month in cash flow, twenty twenty nine seventy five or something. Like that. And that becomes your primary. Yeah, I'm gonna yes. I'm, I'm gonna live mm -hmm. in the second and third floor for a period of time, and then. We'll see. Yeah. Very good. It's so yeah, in Toronto, to your point. Yeah, and I and, but I was thinking the same thing. It's really hard to find cash flow in Toronto, but you know what? Rent's gone up yeah. so, yeah. so damn crazy. much yeah. that the price is actually like prices got away from rent for a while. Yeah. Now rent's gone up and they're getting away from prices. So we're actually in this, this sweet spot right now where if you can go in you can find these things. Um, these little apartments, yeah. Yeah, um, and, it, and it's not just look at what it is right now and and most importantly, look at what it can be. Because you look at some properties, your point, you wouldn't want to live there. Yeah. Put a little lipstick on that pig. That's right. It changes things. Drastic. Yeah, but like 20 years ago, no, maybe 30 years ago, I wouldn't sell it in uh, Leslieville. Right, right. They had all the lead poison. I did 20 years ago. <laughs> and I'll tell you, the day I moved out of that home, I got off the crack. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> they, 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 um, uh, it was all lead on the ground. They had to take two inches off everybody's soil, and then and then and then where where Corbin's is on, on Queen Queen and Broadview. Yeah, I remember somebody bought a, a store there. They moved their business down there in 1987, 88. He says, "Well, I go to the back to my car, and somebody's like rifling through my car." Yeah, yeah but that was yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah, 30, you know, no, 35 like years ago. Yeah. Brooklyn used to be an awful yeah, yeah, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. That's right, by That's all. When I was growing up, Sackville, that, that was the scariest part of town. Sackville was scary. Sackville. We talked about three years ago when they decided yeah. to get us. Yeah, still yeah. 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 The region park. Yeah. Yeah. Still is. It's changing. Thank you. Again. Thank you, guys. I've left you my card there because that, you know, I got it. that would be great. We'll cool. brush you in the database when we go to launch those. Well, that would be great. Actually, that might wouldn't be a bad thing just to give everyone access to that. Because if there's, there's people that want to get their clients into investment stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. they could just go out to an event. 
just sit beside their clients at the point where of initial when their clients want to buy. Yeah. Yeah, and we just did one of those those touch points with everybody this week where we said if you're feeling like your clients have stalled a bit, then you need to bring them the opportunities. And, and again, it's a great way. If your clients bought last year at their home, you know, they can still buy investment property. It, it's funny, I had this conversation with, with a group of agents to say, oh, I feel bad, you know, because it was about, I had a lead gen, a lead gen talk about a month ago in the poor credit, not poor credit, the Mississauga broker. And people, they hated calling and getting shot down. And I said, well, look at it this way. Like, what's your, what's your favorite meal? If, if you were going to go home and, like, the best food was going to be on the table, what would it be? Italian. Italian, okay. So, like, like spaghetti, like, or just, like, okay. So, you picture that beautiful, beautiful plate of pasta, right? Now, we're going to go out, and we're going to go to an all-you-can-eat buffet and just fill ourselves until we basically want to puke. And if you now walk home and there's that plate of pasta sitting on the table, if you're mean, and you're full from that buffet, it doesn't look that good anymore, right? When you get rejected during lead gen, you just found someone that came from the Lake Heath Buffet. Be just because they don't need to move right now, they didn't reject you. They don't need you. It's got nothing to do with you. Stop being so selfish. It's not about you. Right. Right? It, it's just about it's what they need. You're in business to give people what they need. But what they do need is more money. Everyone needs more money. Like it, it, money will never hurt somebody. You know, they can do a lot of good with it. So if, if you're getting rejected, it's not you. It's just you didn't find someone who needed what you can offer at this point yeah. in time. So, here, take the food. I don't want the food. Take the food. I don't want the food. It's the same thing. So, um, yeah. So, but there's a great way to take people that you know take your database and turn it from that you know 12 to 2 ratios that Emory Emory A says and just take it and, and get it back that way. Someone bought a house from you last year. Great. They can buy an investment property from you every single year, and you can keep growing your wealth. When you grow the wealth, they're going to tell their friends. Their friends are going to come to you. So you can build a vicious snowball of awesome. Yeah. Like it just. It's fun. I like it. And, and when you make people money too, like they're really quick. I talked to the other day about Instagram moments. People post the highlight reels of their lives on Instagram. They don't post like getting divorced. Yay! Like it's, it just doesn't doesn't work that way. But if you can create those highlights for a lot of people, they'll share that with other people. People want to have access to those highlights too, and then you become the conduit for that. It just it's great. Mm -hmm. It's great. Mm -hmm.